so are you all back let's start are you all there yes sir okay so let's start again it's such a painful experience i actually uh, let me also announce here i wanted to send an email um i asked the university that uh, i would like to have developmental biology in person you know to teach you in the class but due to recent this uh, regulation by the government the priority is for seniors and thesis students and you know and very uh, unusual situation uh, it was scheduled to be in person i was looking forward to see you in class next week but only few days ago then i i volunteered that okay uh, you know in order to accommodate all the seniors and all the research students uh, i can continue online for me teaching this course is is really uh, i teach this course with a lot of passion in the classroom but i hope uh, i'll try to do my best uh, to come up to your expectations and expectations of my own because this is the course which uh, in my personal experience has highest impact in in students uh, life when they graduate from from lams because they are going to uh, the ones who end up in cell and molecular biology uh, they end up doing one way uh, few things uh, let's say somebody joins a stem cell lab or you know whatever we are doing these days in cell and molecular biology it falls under some hard developmental biology because that is at the interface of genetics and and molecular biology and different disciplines evolution etc so let me uh start uh so now do you see my screen yes sir so the there are two kinds of inductive interactions when we talk in terms of you know induction and uh, the whole concept of induction uh, in terms of cell signaling is that you know uh, one kind of cell type uh, generates a specific uh, signal uh, which is uh, must for inducing uh, cell type specific gene expression program in a responding cell so if you lack that inducer if you lack that signal the responder cells won't respond by uh, initiating a cell type specific gene expression which means uh, there will be defect in uh, cell fate determination if inducers are absent so the example we just looked at uh, of optic vesicle um and when we place optic vesicle in uh, a different region which we just saw uh, we saw that even the inducer is there but uh, respond uh, uh, the ectodermal cells in the trunk region do not respond uh, so what we have learned in the form of pax x and other uh, molecules we just uh, visited through this uh induction and competence concepts is that the signal uh, which is um which is produced by one kind of cell type if it is missing uh, the responder uh, is not going to attain or commit Uh, to a specific cell fate and the whole developmental plan is uh, disturbed when i say developmental plan remember uh, the 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 morphological development in in which we grow um, is something which which is um, which is not less than a plan because you know all different morphogenetic changes all different uh, uh types of changes which occur in our early embryonic development they are somehow controlled in 
in space and in time. And if there is delay in uh, a specific signal at a specific time or in a specific uh, spatial region of embryo, the consequences are deleterious. So uh, when you have one kind of signal which is being produced and then that is received by uh, um, responders and responders respond by changes at the level of gene expression, such kind of uh, interaction or such kind of uh, signaling is called instructive interaction. Instructive interaction is you have one signal and that signal is going to result in specific changes uh, in the form of gene expression in uh, cells which are going to receive that signal. It is uh, described in simple words here. Uh, for example, uh, if you have uh, in the presence of tissue A, uh, responding tissue B develops in a certain way. And example is, for example, we just saw optic vesicle. Uh, can be A and B is the uh, head ectodermal regions which develop in the form of lens. Uh, in the absence of A, which is the optic vesicle, for example, the B does not develop in that way. Uh, in the absence of A, but in the presence of uh, tissue C, uh, B still does not develop in that way. So this last one tells you uh, the kind of instructive interaction taking place between A and B, uh, even if you have a third factor that is not right inducer, B is not going to develop uh, and respond to this kind of signal. Okay. Uh, in contrast to instructive interaction, we have the permissive interactions as well. And the permissive interactions are, um, you know, a cell type, uh, contain all the uh, factors, uh, all it has the potential uh, uh, to maintain itself, to commit itself, uh, and to express whatever it requires to uh, attain a specific cell fate. But it needs a specific environment. In the absence of that environment, uh, there will be defect in, 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 in that particular uh, cell fate development. So here uh, an example for permissive interaction is uh, indeed the extracellular matrix. So many tissues and cells, they need, uh, you know, matrix which contains fibronectin, laminin uh, in order to, you know, grow and develop. Uh, so this fibronectin and, and laminin, uh, they uh, do not alter the type of the cell that is to be produced, but they enable what has been determined to be expressed. So if you, if you lack uh, fibronectin or laminin, uh, you may not change the cell fate. Cell fate is already determined. The gene expression program in response to some instructive interactions has already taken place. Now, the fibronectin and laminin or, or these permissive interactions, they, they just create an in, environment. They, they enable the uh, cell fate, which is already determined to proceed in, in specific fashion or in specific mode. Now, uh, yeah, Momina? Sir, on the previous slide, slide, could you give an example for the third case for instructive interaction? In case of? In the absence of tissue A, but in the presence of tissue C. Yeah, so uh, for example, uh, again, you can look at the optic vesicle example here. You removed optic cup, uh, optic vesicle, and you placed it here. Now, in this region, so optic vesicle is A. A is missing here, B is present, B is not going to develop here, even if you bring in, let's say, a tissue from this region, head ectoderm, you bring in head ectoderm, which is C, let's say here. You're getting signal, but it is not, B is not going to respond. It is not going to respond to 
a non-specific signal being generated by C, which could be trunk ectodermal cell, uh, trunk region, some tissue. Clear? Yes, sir. thank you. As we move on, there will be more examples. I, just off the cuff, uh, I can't recall, but as we move on, you will see the, this concept uh, being used. Mm. Can I think of another example? Uh, Yeah, so let's say you, uh, let's go molecular a bit. Uh, you have optic vesicle and then the head ectoderm. Let's say you created uh, BMP4. I'm just giving you examples because you just covered them. Or FGF. Uh, mutation, either either one of them is missing, okay? Now, these two, in wild type cases, these two are must. Now, if you removed one, you are disturbing the instructive interaction. You say, okay, I bring in ectopic activation. You ectopic, ectopic means away from its natural location. Instead of FGF, Four, you bring in a totally different signaling molecule, let's say notch or something else. Here it's FGF minus minus, but you bring in notch. You won't see changes here in the B. B will not attain the lens forming tissue, even if you have brought a new signal. Did it make things clear now? Yes, sir. So now let's look at another kind of interaction at the uh, cellular level, at the tissue level. And that is uh, what is very frequent during our, our development in different tissues and organs. And this is called epithelial and mesenchymal interaction. Uh, this is one of the best studied instructive uh, induction. Uh, now let's first look at what is epithelial and what is mesenchyme. For, for a student of developmental biology, it's very important to understand different kinds of uh, cell types. So epithelial tissues or epithelium is basically, uh, you know, very well organized, closely attached uh, layer of cells. Uh, this is the epithelial layer or epithelium, okay? And mesenchyme will be loosely attached. Yeah, it's written here. So sheets, or tubes of connected tissues or uh, connected cells uh, which originate from any germ cells, any germ layer. Epithelium uh, can originate from any germ cell uh, and they are uh, sheets or tubes of uh, connected tissue, uh, con connected cells. However, mesenchyme are loosely uh, packed uh, unconnected cells. And I think I gave you example of mesenchyme in, in my last lecture where we saw uh, sea urchin, where you know mesoderm start invaginating, invaginating and cells are not no more connected to each other. They are, they are loosely connected, uh, loosely packed, unconnected cells. Uh, however, in contrast to the epithelium, uh, the mesenchyme cells, they are derived from mesoderm. So easy way is M for mesenchyme and M for mesoderm or the neural crest cell. These are the two uh, founder cells for mesenchymal cells. Now, uh, epithelial and mesenchyme interaction uh, takes place in almost all organs uh, because all organs, they consist of epithelium and associated mesenchyme. In epithelial and mesenchymal interactions, uh, they are one of the most important phenomena in the form of, uh, in the formation of an organ. Uh, for example, let's look at example. Uh, you have, uh, when we talk about uh, skin, uh, 
so skin has two main tissues the outer epidermis which is the epithelium derived from ectoderm and then the dermis uh, which is the mesenchyme tissue derived from mesoderm so we are talking about our, our skin or skin in other animals and it consists of two main tissues uh, as i said all the organs they have epithelium and associated mesenchyme but in 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 this context uh, in the con context of you know uh, induction uh, it's very important to look at this example of skin now this highlights uh, the uh, genetic and the regional specificity which is involved in epithelial and mesenchymal interaction and look at the beauty which is generated as a result of this interaction you have uh, the epithelial epi, uh, epidermal or epithelium look closely attached very well organized uh, connected cells which is the epithelium here and then you have the uh, dermal meso mesenchyme which is this mesenchymal tissue derived from mesoderm and here you can see the cells are loosely uh, packed or unconnected with each other now these interactions so epithelium to mesenchyme interaction in this region so same interaction is resulting in the form of wing feather in the thigh region you can see a, a different kind of feather and then in the foot region same skin interaction results in the form of uh, claw and the scales so epidermis it it secretes proteins the these cells uh, they produce or secrete proteins uh, which are uh, received by the dermal cells they uh, produce or secrete factors which is respond uh, which is received by epidermis just like the reciprocal induction we saw in terms of uh, optic vesicle and lens forming tissue and this very very specific uh, instructive interactions they result in the formation of uh, different kinds of uh, you know uh, organs or uh, or let's say the wing feather looks different than the thigh feather and then uh, all together a totally different organ uh, claw and scales you can also uh, do uh, in situ hybridization uh, using if if you know these factors these proteins uh, you use antibody or you can do in situ hybridization so antibody is the uh, your immunostaining basically immunostaining experiment and in situ hybridization is basically you use rna probe to look for mrna of uh, particular gene which is expressed in a specific position now this epithelium to mesenchyme interaction uh, so look at the precise so this is from birds uh, you can see all the feathers are uh, a result of this interaction and the feathers here in the thigh are going to be different than the uh, wing feathers now um, another experiment which is uh, which was done by uh, spiemann um, and shorte uh, they, that also proved uh, you know interaction and induction which we have covered so far uh, what they did uh, they simply took and this experiment was in two different species uh, for example they took a frog uh, at gastrula stage 
And what they did, they took uh, ectodermal cells of frog and uh, grafted it at presumptive oral ectoderm region. The region which is going to make the mouth part of the newt uh, gastrula. Now, what they saw that uh, the frog ectoderm, it made, uh, it resulted in the uh, mouth parts, the suckers, but, um, you know, they, these suckers were uh, not of perfect newt, uh, but with frog uh, tadpole uh, suckers. Tadpole suckers, okay? Uh, yeah, it's written here. So they did a reverse experiment. They took newt uh, ectoderm, grafted into presumptive oral ectodermal region of frog. Uh, and what they saw now, frog developed with uh, newt um, balancers. Uh, so Walpert explains it in a beautiful way that um, in, in, in Schwiemann described it that the ectoderm uh, says, to the inducer. Uh, so here, basically, this is what he's talking about, this ectoderm, and this is the inducer, okay? So this ectoderm is telling to the inducer that you tell me to make a mouth, all right, I'll do so, but I cannot make your kind of mouth, I'll make my own and I'll do that. And it did it, its own kind, or new ectoderm made. But the interaction is there somehow. Uh, the inducer, whatever signals are being generated from inducer, it is being perceived by the res responder. And it is indeed making oral uh, parts. But since it's an altogether different species, um, of course, this species specific difference is resulting different kinds of mouth, but, but the in, in, uh, interaction between the inducer and the responder remained intact. Now, what kind of uh, um, molecules are there? Uh, we briefly touched upon that, but in, in, uh, in the context of today's lecture, uh, it's very important uh, that we uh, talk about the nature of molecules and the nature of interactions. Uh, these signaling uh, or inducing molecules are one of the types is paracrine factor. And paracrine factors are basically uh, the chemicals which can diffuse uh, freely and then uh, they can induce uh, specific response in the responder cells. The question is how these uh, chemicals or indu in in inducing signals uh, are, are, are transmitted, how they are received. Uh, this was a question of uh, big significance uh, in, in last century. And in case of uh, lens formation, they, uh, when they said, uh, you know, the, um, signal is coming from a neural retina and then lens formation takes place. They did a beautiful experiment that they are to prove that these are diffusible signals. These are paracrine factors. They simply placed a filter between the uh, two tissues. And when they placed a tissue, uh, when still the lens formation could take place, uh, they said, you know, we have signals which are diffusing freely uh, from the uh, inducer, uh, which is being perceived by the responder cells. And these, which means these signals or these inducers or molecules, these are soluble factors. They can uh, pass through the small pores of the filter, uh, and then these inductive events took place. Uh, in response to paracrine factors, which are you know, diffusible, uh, soluble signals, uh, 
there are other uh, interactions which are called juxtacrine interactions. And juxtacrine means, you know, um, between uh, two juxtaposed cell membranes. So one cell, the other cell, and then uh, b between these two juxtaposed cells uh, or membranes of the cells, these interactions uh, can take place. And uh, let me show the juxta. Uh, kind signaling. So for example, this is your um, paracrine factors. Uh, we saw this example here. You know, one cell is producing these chemicals. They are freely diffusing, uh, received by uh, responder cell. And they are received because they have cell surface receptor on the surface of this protein, uh, on, this, uh, on the surface of this cell, uh, corresponding uh, receptor will be there which will receive this signal and then through signal transduction cascade uh, in the nucleus will the signal will be passed or trans, uh, transduced all the way to the nucleus and then cell type specific gene expression will be activated and this was the permissive interaction we talked about where we have you know matrix and then you know uh, cells are in 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 uh, in the in a specific environment and that environment enables uh, self uh, commitment to specific cell paint. Now, uh, in case, the case of juxtacrine uh, signaling, <clears throat> we have a contact, like I, I told you, you have one cell type and then you have the other cell type. Uh, one cell will be having, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> one cell will have the ligand and then the receptor will be on the other. It's like key and lock, but key and lock is between two neighboring cells. And a famous example for juxtacrine signaling is, is uh, notch signaling, where notch is the receptor and then delta is the uh, uh, ligand. So ligand is being produced from one cell, uh, which is... Uh, received by receptor and this is uh, between two juxtaposed membranes of two different cells. In addition to paracrine interactions and, and uh, juxtacrine interactions, which are basically, you know, uh, cell signaling molecules, uh, in humans, we also have the endocrine uh, system and endocrine system is basically these are the hormones which are uh, flowing uh, which are uh, being transmitted in our uh, or transmitted which are um, which are uh, yeah flowing is the right word I, I, I don't have that uh, it's, it's not com coming in my mind so along with the blood flow these hormones are traveling in at specific locations in specific uh, positions in different tissues and organs they are being uh, delivered and we see uh, specific response in, in those uh, tissues. For example, we have uh, pituitary gland in our, in, our, in our brain produces hormones which are uh, delivered to different parts in our body. And all this uh, takes place during early embryogenesis. Um, the, this endo, endocrine hormones are still present in our body. Paracrines are there, juxtacrine are there as we, we are growing uh, as, as uh, fully uh, differentiated or, or, or terminally differentiated organism. So let's look at some of the uh, signaling pathways, um, which are uh, key developmental pathways. Uh, and play a crucial role in our, our development. So major families uh, for paracrine factors are, for example, FGF family, uh, hedgehog family, uh, wingless, or in mammals, it's called wind family, and then uh, TGF super family, it con comprise of TGF beta, active in BMPs, uh, VG1. You have all uh, seen this in cell biology course, I believe. Then uh, these, uh, what is special about paracrine factors? Paracrine factors are actually, uh, as I said, they, these are diffusible molecules, these are chemicals. Uh, 
they bind to very very specific receptors proteins uh, and binding of these paracrine factors to specific receptors it leads to initiation of a cascade of enzymatic reactions for example map kinase signaling is is it is one such uh, signal transduction uh, cascade with through which a lot of cell intracellular and intercellular communication takes place and this kind of uh, series of enzymatic reactions they then uh, end up uh, at you know regulation of uh, transcription factors uh, they result in specific cell type specific gene expression changes or patterns um, when we talk about in terms of early development remember early development involves two things one is pattern formation where you know uh, a specific pattern has to emerge uh, from different clusters of cells um, when you are having uh, you know germ layer formation ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm and this paracrine uh, or juxtacrine or whatever kind of uh, instructive interactions are taking place they play a very crucial role in that early uh, pattern formation and specialization of different cell types uh, another uh, effect of uh, these uh, signal transduction pathways besides uh, regulating transcription factors is regulation of cytoskeleton you know last time we talked about uh, cell movements in gastrulation uh, you know movement of cells in such a way that embryo gets converted from two dimensional to three dimensional embryo and that happens due to these cell movements uh, happen due to changes in cell shape uh, how these cell shape changes are uh, produced that is due to cytoskeletal uh, reorganization and uh who tells the cells to undergo cytoskeletal reorganization is uh, a consequence of uh, cell signaling pathways they uh, it results in change in cell shape uh, migration of cells uh, if shape is not changed uh, you know we may not see cell migration uh, so this is a, a simple cartoon uh, which shows uh, cell signal transduction cascade uh, you have a, a receptor uh, you see this is a, a protein which is uh, having a transmembrane uh, domain then it has extracellular domain which is outside the cell and then it has intracellular domain now this receptor uh, will bind very very specific ligand and this ligand will here it is shown it it is uh, causing some other uh, change in the conformation of the receptor it's dimerizing and binding of ligand results in phosphorylation <clears throat> autophosphorylation of <clears throat> this receptor this phosphorylation acts as a signal for downstream cascade of changes and this phosphorylation results in let's say phosphorylation of another protein uh, which travels within the uh, cytoplasm and then eventually end up in the nucleus to cause specific cell type specific gene expression by activating or repressing some transcription factors or causing changes in Uh, cytoskeletal reorganization um, this is what we just uh, saw so receptor has the uh, extracellular domain transmembrane domain and intracellular cytoplasmic domain uh, ligand binding to the extracellular domain it changes the conformational uh, it induces a conformational change in the receptor uh, that is transmitted through uh, this conformational change uh, the effect of the ligand is transduced through this uh, 
uh, transmembrane domain. And uh, there is usually uh, a kinase activity. Kinase means, you know, it catalyzes phosphorylation reaction, okay? It utilizes ATP and uh, catalyzes phosphorylation, which means addition of phosphorylation uh, phosphate group uh, at a specific tyrosine or serine or uh, threonine, okay? Uh, but mostly what we know, uh, these cell surface receptors, uh, the one which induces tyrosine phosphorylation, we call them RTKs, receptor, tyrosine, tyrosine, kinases, okay? RTKs, the receptor tyrosine kinases is a, is a big field in the uh, signal transduction pathway. Uh, I would like you to, since we are talking about cell signaling today, I would like all of you to go and watch Tony Hunter's uh, seminar. Uh, Tony Hunter is, I think it was a big honor for all of us. He accepted our invite and he talked about um, you know, signal transduction, uh, I think two weeks ago or yeah. And unfortunately I did not see any one of you in the seminar except maybe one or two. So watch this because I just said serine, threonine, uh, tyrosine uh, to, to my poor knowledge and because uh, I, I'm not a very knowledgeable person. I learned a lot. There's history in phosphorylation as well. That was something new in my, my knowledge. And then besides histidine, he mentioned about a couple of other amino acids as well. So you must watch uh, Tony's talk and try to understand how intelligently he has utilized different tools to, to study this. Uh, now, let's look at how the signal transduction pathways, uh, we did already talked about, you know, that there are two predominant ways in which uh, these uh, signal transduction cascades play a role in our development. One is, of course, there is a transcription factor, which is dormant in the uh, cytoplasm. And when the phosphorylation cascade will get activated, it activate a specific transcription factor, which goes into the, cyto uh, into the nucleus and you know, uh, activates uh, specific gene expression pattern, or the other is cytoskeletal reorganization. Now, look at these uh, FGF signaling. Uh, just a quick, I know you have gone through these cell signaling uh, pathways in, in cell biology. If you have forgotten, uh, it's never too late to go back and, uh, you know, brush up your uh, basics you, you went through. FGF is a, is a, uh, signaling pathway, over a dozen structurally related uh, members exist in the vertebrates uh, when we talk about FGF family. For example, FGF1, uh, it's an acidic in nature. Uh, FGF2 is, is a basic FGF. Uh, FGF7 sometimes goes by the name of carotenocyte growth factor. If you look at this, the uh, uh, these FGF uh, genes uh, or over, yeah, over a dozen of distinct FGF genes in vertebrates, uh, they uh, contribute to hundreds of protein isoforms. Uh, they are alternatively spliced. And then you can imagine if there are dozen FGF genes and they undergo alternate splicing, uh, you can generate a couple of hundred uh, or even maybe more based on the extent of alternate splicing, the protein isoforms. <clears throat> uh, sometimes the initiation codons are in different, uh, you know, using different initiation codons, uh, the diversity can be generated as well. Now, what these FGF uh, signaling does, look, this is the in situ, uh, and FGF plays crucial role in your brain de development. And then these somites, all your spine, these, if you look at early uh, 
development, uh, you will find perfect or precise expression of uh, of FGF in uh, in in your cell mites. If you uh, have mutations, we are dead. We will never say uh, we'll never proceed. Even if we develop, uh, we'll see severe morphological defects. So FGFs. Uh, FGF. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they activate a uh, set of RTKs uh, and these receptor tyrosine kinases. These receptors are called fibroblast growth factor receptors, FGF are <coughs> for receptors. FGFs are the uh, ligands here. They are, so uh, as I told you, they're associated with a uh, number of developmental functions, which include angiogenesis, uh, which angiogenesis means blood vessel formation, mesoderm formation, axon extension. Um, and there is some kind of redundancy as well. Uh, where sometimes uh, they can substitute one another and their expression pattern can give them separate functions. Uh, but there are uh, specification as well. For example, FGF2 is for angiogenesis and FGF8 is for development of midbrain and, and, and the limbs, etc. Then the hedgehog family of signaling proteins. Um, hedgehog is actually... Uh, not only in mold in cell type specific uh, cell fate determination, but also uh, compartmental boundaries uh, formation in, for example, in flies, hedgehog is studied in great detail. In vertebrates, we have uh, three different forms of hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, Indian hedgehog, and desert hedgehog. And uh, sonic hedgehog is uh, specifically in notochord formation. It is most widely used uh, in patterning the neural tube. Uh, the Indian hedgehog invertebrates is for gut and cartilage uh, and the postnatal bone growth. And desert hedgehog is in the Sertoli of the testes. Uh, and if you have mutation in desert hedgehog, you have defective uh, spermatogenesis. Uh, sonic hedgehog uh, is the a minor terminal two thirds of the molecule is secreted only. And it then results in uh, patterning neural tube formation, uh, which is then contributing to uh, motor neurons from ventral and sensory neurons. Patterning of somites also is due to sonic hedgehog. If we do look at the, uh, the in situ hybridization, you can see uh, this is uh, the earliest sign of uh, limb formation. This is just a, a dot. Uh, you see, this is the R, but this is just the dot. Uh, and then, you know, the left, right uh, axis in the chick as you know, this is, we also have left, right. This is my right and this is my left. This is the left, right uh, axis formation. Uh, anterior posterior axis also uh, in the limbs is also due to uh, hedgehog signaling. And then the digestive tube uh, formation uh, and feathers uh, in chicks are also uh, due to role of sonic hedgehog. Now, what is hedgehog? How, wh what is the ligand and receptor and how it, signal is transduced. So hedgehog receptor is called PASHT. Uh, hedgehog is the ligand indeed. Hedgehog is the receptor. So this is the PASHT receptor, which is normally uh, kept in inactivated form by a protein called smoothened. Uh, it keeps it in inactive state. When the hedgehog ligand will come there, the smoothened will become non-functional and hedgehog uh, will then the signal trans will be transduced and uh, you you see the transduction of hedgehog signal in the form of there's a transcription factor 
which is called cubitus interruptus. Cubitus interruptus is normally uh, held in inactive mode uh, with by its association with uh, microtubule. And as soon as the signal transduction uh, through phosphorylation cascade takes place, the proteins cause and fused which hold cubitus interruptus CI in inactive form, they get uh, phosphorylated and cubitus interruptus is released uh, and eventually it moves into the nucleus where it activates, it binds to the DNA. Together with Krebs binding protein, it activates transcription of hedgehog responsive genes, genes which hedgehog wants to activate. In the wild type, not in wild type, in case of, uh, in the absence of hedgehog, when hedgehog signaling is not taking place, the, uh, when smoothen blocks, the, uh, keeps the receptor in inactive mode, Protein kinase A phosphorylates the cubitus interruptus and cubitus interruptus is uh, proteolytically cleaved and then only uh, the form of cubitus interruptus which goes into the nucleus, it does not activate, rather it represses the genes. So no transcription of hedgehog responsive genes. So hedgehog responsive genes only get active when signal is transduced in the form of phosphorylation. Uh, cubitus interruptus is released and intact cubitus interruptus goes and now activates the transcription. Uh, what, wait. Yeah. So Cholesterol is an extremely important factor in hedgehog signaling, uh, cleavage of uh, sonic hedgehog and patched, uh, they also require uh, cholesterol. Um, so now you, you see, um, normally as molecular biologists, you just, and I would caution you, don't just think of genes and proteins and proteins, the ultimate molecules. I think this is a very uh, narrow approach to understand cellular function. Uh, you have to look at, um, when you think of cell signaling, you have to look at you know uh, lipids in the cells, carbohydrates in the cells. Uh, you know, then you have to think in terms of uh, electrostatic interactions, uh, look at just a phosphate, uh, addition of phosphate group uh, is causing uh, a complex transmission of signal all the way to the nucleus. Now, I often wonder when I um, look at cell uh, and then I look at, you know, genes and proteins, uh, I must say I miss a lot when I don't look at uh, the intracellular communication, which is due to uh, cations and anions and, and then uh, bioelectromagnetic. Uh, this word may sound too much to you at the moment, but I personally believe this is the future of biology. This is where biology will go. Even when you look at transcriptional changes, RNA polymerase too, uh, you know, here onto, onto, uh, sitting onto gene, you have to look at these interactions of these transcription factors or these molecules, which are bringing in message uh, because these messages are being communicated in uh, femtoseconds. You, you know, you, you place a, uh, you place a sweet molecule on your tongue and your whole body perceives that signal. And that is what I meant by, you know, um, intercellular communication and, and a very fast communication mode, which is much more than just a protein, okay? 
then uh, wind signaling uh, it's uh, it's called in flies it's called wingless uh, because you know when it was discovered it resulted in wingless flies uh, it's a family of uh, cysts rich glycoproteins uh, okay and uh, it's very important in segment polarity uh, you know during development in in fly in in invertebrates and in the vertebrates uh, polarity of the insect and the vertebrate limbs uh, as well as the uh, urogenital system is due to the precise and the fu normal function of uh, wind signaling the ligand is called here uh, wind the receptor is uh, frizzled uh, you have a protein which is called disheveled in the absence of uh, wind disheveled is uh, bound to the uh, is bound to the uh, frizzled receptor and one of the protein which is which responds to the wing wind signaling is called beta catenin so in the absence of wingless signaling uh beta catenin although goes inside the nucleus um and bind to c mic or transcription uh, it it leads to uh, transcription of the genes which must be active in response to uh in response to wind signaling uh however normal uh in 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 the absence of uh, wind signaling what happens uh, the apc uh, complex that results in degradation of normally degradation of beta catenin normally beta catenin won't be able to go into the nucleus in the absence of wind signaling when you have wind ligand bound to the frizzled now the apc complex which contains gsk3 etc which normally causes degradation of the beta catenin when wind binds the signal is transduced through the disheveled to block this degrading complex and release the beta catenin which then goes to the nucleus and activates genes which are uh, wind respond uh, resp uh, responsive genes however if you have mutated beta catenin let's say you 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 did mutagenesis uh, and what you see you know uh, gain of function mutation where wind uh, is mute uh, sorry the beta catenin is mutated in such a way that the degrading complex is unable to degrade this now it will go into the nucleus and activate uh, wind responsive genes so all these pathways whether it was hedgehog it was uh, FGF, uh, it's uh, wind. They are understood through uh, functional genomics, through um, you know, analysis of mu mutants, generation of mutants, uh, and wind mutant or hedgehog mutant. You know, what we found, for example, in flies, and there was um, severe defects in uh, compartmental boundaries and segmentation of the um fly embryos and fly embryos were not growing normal uh, so, and once they found okay later on they discovered that okay this, this is wingless is basically a glycoprotein and it's a ligand and then they characterized later on uh, biochemically people characterized uh, the function of these uh, signaling uh, molecules uh, here you see defects uh, if you have, uh, this is the uh, kidney, then gonads, and if you have uh, wind uh, signaling as defect, you have a defective uh, urogenital uh, or the gonad formation or, or other body parts. Uh, TGF beta is a, what is time now? I think this is just the last slide. Oh, I'm, so TGF beta is a super family. Uh, over 30 structurally related members are there 
and uh, their proteins are processed and only the carboxy terminal regions, they contain the mature peptide. For example, here it's TGF beta uh, like ligand. And then this is all this is, uh, you know, uh, TGF beta super family. Uh, different kinds of ligands you can see, uh, you can appreciate the kind of complexity we have uh, in, uh, in the signaling. And the molecules, the transcription factors, SMADs are activated in response to TGF beta uh, signaling or BMP uh, signaling. And then these SMADs, just like you know, beta catenin or cubitus interruptors, they go inside the nucleus and activate uh, cell type specific genes. You have JAK-STAT pathway, another you see if you have JAK-STAT mutations or defective JAK-STAT signaling, and the rib cage of the um, uh, organisms is is totally uh, is is affected, and very narrow rib cage, narrow chest is uh, formed. Very severe morphological defects. So you have to purpose of bringing a, and having a quick recap of all these uh, signaling pathways is uh, yeah. Maybe next time I, I bring this uh, cell death pathway, et cetera. These two slides we'll talk in the next slide, the next lecture. Okay. Uh, the purpose of bringing cell death is that you know it's not only proliferation, it's uh, cell signaling, which results in programmed cell death. Now, we need to kill many cells to be normal. Um, for example, this. Uh, mouse is showing, this is the wild type mouse. And if you have, uh, you know, um, mutation in cell death pathway, and there are, you know, uh, there are specific cell death path, program cell death pathway, for example, BCL2, uh, APAF uh, mediated signaling, and then eventually caspases are activated. Caspases are uh, proteins uh, which cleave certain uh, essential proteins, destroy them, and that leads to uh, apoptosis or programmed cell death. Uh, and if you look at the uh, defect in cell death uh, due to mutation, knockout uh, mouse, which carry mutation in cell death pathway, you see brain is uh, defective. It's no more normal. Why? Because cells which are supposed to be killed because humans, uh, they, we have many more neurons. Uh, nearly 10 to the 11, uh, uh, this is the number of neurons. So the number of neurons which are present during our development, they are much more than the number of neurons which we carry at the time of our birth. So where all those huge number of neurons go, they are, they are, uh, they undergo cell death in a programmed manner uh, using the cell uh, signaling pathway. And uh, then we are born with normal brain. Now, once you lacked this cell death pathway, look, you have all those neurons still there and you are abnormal, you are no more normal, you, you will die more or less immediately. Uh, similarly, our digits, uh, these fingers, uh, they carry a uh, web. Uh, and if you look here, already you, can, you cannot see digits clearly. There is web and this, just like ducks uh, have this web. Uh, this web is also, uh, it undergoes program cell death and we have beautiful symmetry of hand and, and, and these digits. So with that, I finished today's lecture. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, juxtacrine signaling and uh, extra, uh, the extracellular matrix or what we call the permissive signaling uh, in the next lecture. Any question? Uh, uh, sir, uh, recitation ka time decide karna hai abhi. Mani email ki thi, toh kuch logo ne reply kiya tha. Uh, I think Monday, Wednesday or Friday kaafi logo ki labs hai. So hmm. probably Tuesday, Thursday, Thursday ka jo mujhe feasible lag raha tha according to those people jinnohne reply kiya tha 6 to 7 pm 